All right, everyone, you guys are in for a big treat because we have not just one guest today, but two guests today who are going to share with you a story that I literally would have told you was impossible myself. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have told people <laughs> that this is impossible. So we have found um, a couple. They are Emma and Gary. And the very special thing about them is they both used medication-assisted treatment to conquer um, addiction to opioids. One of them used uh, Suboxone and one of them used methadone. And not only did they both use medication-assisted treatment to come off of opioids, but they did it while a couple. They did it at the same time, and they're still alive and haven't even divorced yet. Can you believe it? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? All right, let's meet them. Let's hear how they pulled this off and see what kind of advice they have for us or for anyone in this situation who's trying to get on the other side of it. All right, so Emma, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about mm, you? You, how sort of how you progressed into opioid addiction, just sort of the beginnings of it. And then we'll hear from Gary and hear how he sort of started into it. And then we'll make y'all stories come together maybe and figure out your journey together. So I started using opiates when I was 14, um, kind of on and off again. Um, and when I was probably 223, um, I'd worked up to injecting them and um, from all there. So I was just downhill <laughs> from there. Um, and I was about 32 when I got on the uh, Suboxone. Okay. And so one of the things that I tell families a lot, Emma, is that opioid addiction is hard to detect, especially the first few years. Did your, did anyone around you know that that was going on? Cause you started so young and so early. So um, when I was that young, it was more of just like a weekend thing here and there. So nobody noticed. Um, mm -hmm. And when, when it was progressed into injecting, even I would say that I did a pretty good job of hiding it from everybody. Okay. And, and Gary, what about you? What's the beginning of your your story. How did it start for you? Um, I had a, a surgery on my ear here. I had to have uh, in Halifax as we did our surgery. I had a uh, torn eardrum and a cyst that had to be taken in. So when I got off the surgery, I got back. They put me on dilatics. Prescription ran for a few months and it just picked up from there. It never stopped. Wow. So from that point on, it was about a seven-year stretch. How How old were you when you had the surgery? Thirty-five or thirty-six. Eh? Okay. So your stories of how you got into this are really different. That's That's also interesting. Were you, did you have any substance abuse issues at all before the surgery? Like even with anything else? I, I drank probably more than I needed to, but I, I drank my whole life since I was about 16. And as far as other drugs, I drank pretty much everything, but I regularly it never became a problem. Um, when I ended up on the opioids though, kind of silver lining, I guess, they don't go well with drinking. So I actually quit drinking and I haven't, I haven't drank in many years now, eight years. Now, as far as you had mentioned, hiding it from people, well, I held down a full-time job for five years while in the same thing as I'm injecting and hiding from pretty much everybody. So it just became a part of life. And explain to people who don't understand how that can even happen. Explain how you can hide it for so long. I'm good around people. I've always had jobs and customer service. I have been used for what? As I say, it's using together, oh, kind yeah. of like covered each other's uh, lies. And, and also I, what I did is, I, mean, I guess you did the same thing. Is I ended up isolating myself from all my friends. I didn't see any of my friends. Cut off my ties. family members cut off all ties. So it made it easier to hide when you're not hanging around with people. And I also didn't want to bring that, bring them into that part of my life. So that kind of made it easier. I think it was just isolating ourselves, being codependent. And we just kind of kept to ourselves and isolated ourselves from everybody yeah. for like four years. Did it affect your work performance? No, yeah. my work performance. Yeah. I mean, it was totally, dependent. my whole day depending on it right like if i got up in the morning we didn't have something i'm gonna go to work sick and i'm gonna be there sick until you know until i'm able to get that, that and, it was, and it was more of a support thing where i would make sure i could bring it to him or we could meet up and that type of thing like i don't think you would have been able to yeah. do as long if i hadn't been but my as far as my performance i mean i worked alongside a guy for three years no one ever mm -hmm. knew anything I, I would just do it it was hard on my body I hated it but i would just do it and if i got a quiet moment to myself then i'd maybe go that side and just hide it until the moment uh, i could it's a choice i mean i was the only one working at the time. So it wasn't really an option. Okay. Now I'm trying to follow the storyline here, right? Like it's a flow chart in my head. So Emma, you were using from really young, started out just occasionally escalated. And then Gary, you didn't start using until you're 35. Where in the stories connect and collide? I got on the medication. So when he started using, of course, that was the 
um, I was going through a hard time actually medically, like with a medical issue myself. So it was just like the perfect excuse to let things get really out of hand. Yeah, and then that was the point we started using the desert and it just went on from there. So when you met, when the two of you met, were, were you both already using at that point? I had never touched it. Okay. And I wasn't using at that time. Like I said, it was just on and off. That type of, that type of was never my thing. I didn't like that type of thing. So I had never touched it really until that surgery when I had gotten it. So you know, it was never an issue with me before. But when we met, we were okay with like, we would drink a lot together and stuff like that um, or use other drugs like on the weekend and stuff like that together recreational type thing okay so Gary when you met Emma she wasn't using opioids at the time but she had sort of a history of on and off use of opioids did you know that or you didn't know that not in the beginning but she told me through fairly soon so it didn't it didn't seem to bother me it was in her past and I mean with my my past I had no reason to judge anybody so and at that time like I said she wasn't using and you know if that surgery had to come up who knows so because it wasn't something we were we were doing together at the time until that happened okay then emma you said you had a medical problem at some point too and that's when yours started flaring up when did that start happening well i pretty almost at the same time that he had had his um surgery um i just had um it was actually so i had like an undiagnosed lyme disease so i had been having issues for quite a while um that i was dealing with um it was getting more serious around the time that he had his ear surgery so it again was just kind of like an excuse um where i was an excuse to myself where i was saying like i'm going through a hard time um and the opiates are around and like, it was just a perfect storm the cyst in your brain that advised you the cyst in your brain that it was cancer or not mm-hmm. so there was a period so, where she didn't know if she had brain cancer or not yeah, so. yeah i could have thought that i might have um, yeah. So That's that was really, for reals. Um, I was just uh, looking for any excuse for anything really. And so, well, who decided that they didn't want to do it anymore first? It we both, we both knew we needed to stop for a long time before we did. We made attempts, not actually getting help on medication. I always thought I could do it myself. I, I did mm-hmm. it else myself. The other one, this kick apps. No, I couldn't do it myself. So we had to go ask for help. But I don't think either one of us came to the other and said, no. we need to quit or it was just a collective we knew it's time it's like and we wanted to quit for years before we actually did, though but as far as uh, the clinic she did go in before him. oh as far as yeah so as far as like who actually went to made the first attempt step i guess that was me and the clinic um and got on it first a couple of days before yeah, a couple of days. okay so so emma you were the first one that got on medication assisted treatment but you guys had had attempts where you both tried to stop Lots of times before that. Yes. Many times. Okay. Many times. Because we thought we could just do it, you know. Um, you get to do our own taper. I even uh, had done up like a little schedule of like our own taper to do. But yeah, that didn't work. By the time you get to day two, so, we are all stuck over at that point. So. Tell us why that doesn't work. Like, I understand why it doesn't work, but there's probably people watching this video where it was like, it would be like, well, if you're going to do medication assisted treatment and taper, why can't you just taper? already they're they're wondering that especially family members so explain that to us um yeah that's a good so part of it is just um it's so much longer of a process than you would think it's going to be like my taper do up for like a week or two but in reality if you were going to do that with like the pills uh, it would be a month it should be a month long thing and you just as a drug addict, you don't have the self-control to have, um, you know, a bunch of pills around and actually lock them out to yourself in that way. It's just, I'm sure it's neat. I'm sure, I don't know any drug addicts that could do that. Right. And, and I, that's something that a lot of the people that we see, they try to do with different drug addictions, right? But that's the whole nature of addiction means I don't manage it well, right? <laughs> addiction means I can't ration it out. And so it, it kind of goes against the whole thing, right? It just doesn't, doesn't work. Okay. What's the difference between doing it that way and then doing it with like the, the Suboxone or the Methadone? What, how's that different? With me, the, the other way was more the tapering down. I had never been experienced with that. You know, I never worked in that industry. So with me, it was just ignorance. I thought I could do it. And I just kept saying, oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Until one day I was like, well, I can't. That whole time, home was just basically thinking I could beat this on my own because I had with everything else. But this got too hard. So we went to the Methadone and the Methadone was it was, it was, uh, you, I think it was at 175 to begin with. Right. Just like once you get on it, just being able to sleep through the night though. You know, sleep through the night was a gift. Like when you first take it and you wake up the next day, you got a full night's sleep. It was unbelievable. So it was a little bit different with the, with the pills when you try to taper. You're waking up every day sick. Uh, you got responsibilities. It, it's a whole, whole different ballgame, really. The first morning that like yeah. he, we weren't sick together, we were just like almost 
giddy. Couldn't believe it. We were also <laughs> giddy because we were like, can you believe they're like not sick and don't have to go run around and look for something? Like, it was unbelievable. It was just, it's been the first time in years and it was just, um, this, this, that was one of the huge, you know, differences is just, and then, you know, you can and go you to the pharmacy. you also know it's there. That's the big thing. Sometimes when you do it the other way, you got to find that stuff. And if it's not around, your list is and your tour is not going to work. You know, this is there. It's there on a daily basis. You don't have to go hunt for it. You don't have to stress for it. People are there. They're going to give it to you. It's a big difference mentally. Right. And I'm so glad you, you said that because um, for those of you who don't know, the medication-assisted treatment medicines, both of them, whether it's the Suboxone or the Methadone, they're just longer lasting than either pain pills or heroin or anything you're going to get naturally. When you're doing those, you're like on this three to four to five hour cycle, right? Like literally every so many hours, you're sick again. And so you can't manage your life because you're on this treadmill, right? Wow. Wow. Four hours. Okay. It's all day. It's it's you wake up in the morning to go to work and then when you do that you're thinking well i need that for the afternoon and then it's well i need that for nighttime or i'm not going to sleep it's it controls so your, your whole life day. revolves around it with two more of a um like you said it's such a short term yeah. cycle your whole life revolves around if, you, yeah. if you've got something you need to plan on where you're getting it next and stuff like that whereas once as soon as you get on the um treatment you know that you can go every day or or if you've got your medication or whatever so and you I, don't have to the psychologically it's not as and probably the number one thing I know we're in Canada. I don't know the same thing. The cost, the methadone's covered. Yeah, or you got to come up with even, that every day if you're doing. You got to come up with money. Even apps come up with money for this. Or even if you're paying for it out of your pocket, it's, I mean, it's still not. It's still going to be such a fraction of yeah, the cost of um, what you're getting. Exactly. So, so the, there's several things about it that helped you guys break the cycle. One is it was longer lasting, and not only that, but you didn't have to figure out where you were going to get it again, right? Because you you had a plan for that. So that allows you to kind of like start your life back right it allows you to do regular life stuff like go to work and parenting or go to class or whatever it is that you're doing you can focus on something else because you're, you're kind of off the treadmill and then also the money right the you guys are saying yeah money. yeah, yeah. I and mean, then, you know, these people you get from they know you need it eventually and you get manipulated by the name you know what they want so the yeah there's the right. whole manipulation there or you know, you're relying on somebody else um who obviously doesn't does- who doesn't really have your best interest at heart obviously um and there's all that uh too it's just so many layers of complicated problems <laughs> a lot of different reasons why it was a lot better it, it takes the desperation level down right so that you can think clearly enough to figure out the next step i would guess right <laughs> The, uh, with that, once I got off that treadmill, when I started meditating, yeah, which made a big difference in my life. And at that point, it was all about control. It had nothing to do with the treadmill anymore. I'm, I'm not the person that likes to be in control. I know that's a good thing, but just the way I am. And the life, the whole five years of the pills, I had no control over my life. Nothing was good, but I still had no control. I had to go there every day. I couldn't travel. If I didn't have it, I'd have to switch it. So the big thing is me is I want to control my life back. So once I got that past that treadmill, I was like a straight well, focus. You could, you could kind of like taste, see what it would be like if you were. Yes. It's so much better just on the methadone. So mm-hmm. then we could kind of see the light of it would be so much better. If we, though, like for people that need to stay on it, I mean, that's mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, but but that was the difference with me with getting off the treadmill. Then I was just focused. That was the next step. Like you said, the next step, that was it for me. The control of my life back. So one of, the, one of the things that they're saying, you guys, is that not only did they get on the medication assisted treatment, but their plan, some people get on it and stay on it. They maintain on it. It's like a maintenance. But you guys got on it with the intention of okay. coming okay. off of it. Is what you're saying. Well, I got a, I, a point where I was, I, I said to my pharmacist, I said, well, we were going in, they given us carries for coke. And what had happened, we went in and they started giving us carries. They want people coming into pharmacy. So one day we showed up to get the carries and they were like, your carries are done. Because you're going to have to come in every day, no notice. So I was like, well, like traveling from Stanley every day is. Uh, so you had to do the, um, urine screens every week if you were going to get carries yeah. um, and we hadn't been doing that because of COVID so we just kind of got caught in a um, you have to come in every day type thing um, which was drive for us so I guess that's what kicked off the let's get off it right now type yeah. thing but what, even when we started off on it um, it was kind of like a we thought we could do, so we had a very um, lofty goal of being off it in like a few months or something like that that was crazy that wasn't going to work at all um, but that was always our goal was because we knew a lot of people that were had been on it for like i know it has been on it for 15 years or whatever and i mean it's better than using um pills for heroin or whatever for sure um if that's I don't your know two choices office, but yeah so we don't know anybody that's got and i just i just was like i don't want to be like that and be on it in 15 years from now and it's still be running my life um 
What I was so say we had always planned to just use it as a little, like a gap, uh, bridge for the gap, but um, it took us quite a bit more than we had anticipated. So, so, sped up well, once the point that, that, that the way there was a big So hold on one second, because you guys are saying some really important things there. There's like, there's several things you guys are saying I really want to emphasize. One thing, well, first I want to, because you, you're using the term carry and not everyone knows what that means. What they're talking about is um, in the United States, it's this way with methadone, but not usually with Suboxone, but you guys are in Canada. And so the way it works is you have to show up every morning at the place where you get it to get your dose for the day, right? And so it's not as much chaos as when you're trying to get every four hours and you don't know where you're going to get it, but it still ties you to the place every single day and there's no missing. <laughs> and so, which is rough. And and what you guys are saying is when COVID started, they would give you carries, which means they would give you more than one day at a time. So you didn't have to go every day. I just want to make sure everyone understands that. And so, we can follow up. Right. And you have to once a, week. once a week. Okay. Usually you kind of have to work up to that. Um, in the United States, like if you're on methadone, if you go long enough, you're compliant, you pass all your drug tests, stuff like that, they'll, they'll give you like a weekend carry. And then, and then if you do really good with that, they'll, they'll do a week or something like that. In Canada, you both had to do that for Suboxone and methadone, even though you guys were getting two different things, you both had to show up every day. So we probably, we could have, um, done the urine screens, um, long enough um to get like a i think you, i don't know three or six months of clean urine screens you need months, and months. then you can start to get um a week at a time or a month at a time it just so happened that it lined up with the covid for us that we started getting those before we normally have and then they just when they get taken away it was kind of last minute so we didn't really know so the daily it was, it was really frustrating that we went from being having a week at a time um and then we had to go back to the day at a time so it really we were like, we're going to get off this. Like, and that's, point, that's, when, that's when I started dropping five milligrams twice a week, right? like a really high amount, right to the point where I, it ended. But I ended up getting pretty sick from it. But, yeah. mo- I was going to say, most people would have to probably would do you, I wouldn't down. recommend that. No, I'd recommend it down a lot slower. Okay. I just got upset and frustrated that I had to keep coming in every day. So I wanted to end it as quick as I could. Mm-hmm. So. so can you guys tell us? the difference between suboxone and methadone and can you give us some kind of idea because you're you're talking about Gary you're talking about dropping five milligrams give us some perspective on how that what kind of milligrams you were on and 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 how that was going down like what's what's the standard dose of suboxone what's the standard well, dose of methadone I could answer with the tapering down part but so you started on 150 175 175 of uh, and I think that probably um like a fairly normal um, and when I started on Suboxone, I was on 36 milligrams. And I think that's probably a fairly standard um, dose for, I think those are probably pretty standard doses. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the for, difference between the two, you might be able to Well, I was, was going to say the, like, as far as from our perspective, um, I think I had an easier time uh, on the Suboxone, um, especially when we started dropping and I thought the other good thing with Suboxone was um, I didn't relapse once I was on the Suboxone, but if I had, it's kind of like an overdose um, prevention in there because um, I previous, because. like before, um, anytime I'd done times of sobriety, that was when I had t- overdosed in the past um, because you forget how much your tolerance goes down and stuff like that. So um, that's one of the huge positives to me. Um, and like I said, when we start tapering, um, I seemed to have a much easier time of it than he did. Um, he would have, like I said, we went faster than we should have, but he would have days where he was really sick and experiencing withdrawals almost as bad as we were um, I think I went coming off the pillow. 200 days in a row of throw up every morning. So it was, it was hard on you for sure. Yeah. Wow. You were dropping in a much faster because you went so fast. For t- I just want you guys to hear that for two. <laughs> hundred days in a row, right? That's why you don't hear many people that do this because I mean, that's a long time to feel bad, right? Like just tolerating that discomfort for that many days is like, wow. I tell people, if you want to get off it, it's, you're going to have to go through some discomfort. It's not going to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to accept that. It's, it's a, you know, it's a solution to one, but it's just a stop gap to another. Um, you're going to be sick every day anyway, but when you wake up sick every day and you're going to get pills, there's no end in sight, right? 
you're just, it's never going to get better. When you wake up sick every day and you're trying to come off of it, there is light in the tunnel. Might be a long tunnel, but there's light down there. (laughs) And the same with the doctor. uh, Like like I said, maybe if you don't, if you feel like people are condescending or whatever, or um, not supportive to the chances are, maybe they're not. Don't give up. There's others out there. You'll find the right one. I love that because it's like you, you feel bad enough physically feel bad enough right and even emotionally feel bad enough i mean it sucks having to go in there every day right like that can't be that's not psychologically that's no good either and if you got someone that's talking down to you or treating you crappy it's not going to help anything at all right like you need some support because it's hard it is hard people i've only just as, so people understand how hard it yeah, is it's very hard, I, right? yeah i only know a few people who have tapered off of suboxone like outpatient and you're the second person i've met gary that's tapered off of methadone only second i've been doing this a long time both canadian boys right? <laughs> and both canadian guys right <laughs> right that's right the other guy i know was from Can- canada too right <laughs> and and i don't know if you guys have seen his video but he, he got on a bike and rode across canada come off methadone rode across canada on a bike i was like what? Yeah. crazy yeah I better not watch that for that. <laughs> I would like to say that's amazing. Yeah, that's super. Yeah, it is. And the, the thing that's super amazing about you alls story, not only did y'all do that, but you did it while still together. Tell us about that part, like the relationship part while all that was happening. I mean, that that right there just makes it 10 times more unbelievable because usually one person is going to, you know, their willpower is going to run out. They're going to want to cave and then the other person caves and then this person caves. It's just like back and forth triggering each other. So how did y'all do that together well um that's a good question too um i think for so first like i said it'd been years that we were like really sick and tired of being sick and tired Mm -hmm. um and really really wanted to stop and it was really only the physical addiction that was keeping us there at that point and on on the other hand i think that we both decided for ourselves like i I was doing this one way or another you were doing one way or another and it's basically the point that one of us was going to do it and the other one wasn't well the other one wasn't going to be around yeah I see how we made the point to each other. So it was either we're going to do this. And, it, and it did. I think we were so co- codependent for so long. It, it helped, you know, if you're feeling bad, I could bounce something off her. It kind of get, so it was good to have a friend there that knew you were going through. And on the other hand, I think yeah. we're both really competitive. And um, yeah. I just want everybody to know that I'm still three days ahead of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <awesome. laughs> That's so funny. Okay. All right. And so you guys were so determined on it. That was your number one priority. I don't want to pretend we didn't have rough times. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to pretend to everybody there wasn't rough times because there was. Yeah. The fights, the emotional, you know, bad. You feel like when I wake up in the morning, I was had draw so bad that I wasn't pleasant to be around. It was just the way that was. And so there was a lot of tough times, but I just don't want to pretend like it was smooth sailing. Mm, it was No. But in the end. It but like I said, but like it, the, on the positive side, there was like, it was really good because nobody, like nobody understands how hard it is but at least we could look at each other and like yeah i know what you're going through there'd be times sometimes our father would ask me a question about well why is this and you just you've never been there if you've never been there it's hard for me to explain why i mean you know what i mean mm-hmm. Make these decisions over or, others yeah so there's like that somebody that's been there and no talking about it. My cat just just a minute. In here. Sorry. <laughs> so so speaking of the, yeah. the fathers did both of y'all's families what was the family reaction did your families know you had the addictions did your families know you did the medication assisted treatment if so like how did they respond that. Well, I, I, I don't have a lot of family left. I have my mom and a, like I lost both my sisters. My father died when I was eight. Uh, but I hate that from them. My mother knows the treatment I went through. She only said, and because they only because she's, I, I told nobody, no friends, even when I was going through the treatment, I didn't want to tell anybody. I don't know. I was just embarrassed or ashamed by it. I didn't want to let anybody to know. So um, right now, so- only my mother knows. And even my friends that I grew up as when I was five years old still don't know that I was on and off and stuff. Wow. I pretty much hidden from everybody. Um, my family did know, um, and they were very supportive of us getting on the um, treatment, um, for sure. Um, then they were very supportive. Like, I think it was easier with her family because she had been there before. They'd experienced that before with her. And so there wasn't really, like they knew that I had a problem, I guess. And I think yours was to protect your mom. Is she, you didn't want to bring that extra burden on her. Um, and it was so, I just didn't want to bring that into people's lives. I just felt like it was better. So I just keep it away from people. It's the best. And though it shouldn't have happened like this, but I basically rage told him that he was on methadone. Um, it's but the best. <laughs> it, it was the best in the end. Like I shouldn't have happened that way, but I think it was, um, yeah. you know, 
Otherwise, I might not told anyone. <laughs> Probably. Not. But it's easier when you're not trying to still hide that to all from your family and friends. So, Emma, you said your family knew and they were fairly um, supportive. And no one really knew on Gary's side except your mom knew you had the problem, but didn't know you were on the treatment until Emma, right? Ra- Would you say you raged told it, Emma? You got mad and said it. Is that what happened? She didn't know, didn't know, the she didn't know about the problem either. Oh, until okay. She's kind of. She had no idea I'd been on that. Gotcha. Okay. How long did it take each of you to to taper? Now, Emma, I know you said you had your three days. So since you're winning the race, I'm going to let you say first. (laughs) Um, So do you mean from the time that we started the taper until I was able to quit the Suboxone? Yes. Yes. Uh Okay. So so that was um, about two years, I think. A little under two. A little under two years, like um, a year and 10 months. A year and nine months or something like that, I believe, from from when I started it until when I took my last those and what advice now your, your, yours was, Mine was close to what was that sorry um before we because i didn't get to hear gary's yet before we hear gary's though what advice would you have for someone coming off of suboxone and before you answer anyone watching this we're not doctors i'm not a doctor they're not doctors we're not giving you medical advice we're just helping you understand emma and gary's experience so emma tell us what would you tell someone else who's either already going through it or thinking about going through it well that's a good question too because part Part of, uh, I was going to say, be ready for a long haul. And it's kind of like, I felt like when I had it beat, there was still a lot more left. Um, so I guess it's like a marathon, not a, you know, it's a long haul thing. At the same time, I don't want to be discouraging to people because um, at the same time, if somebody told me that at the beginning, that it's going to be years, a years long journey, I might have been frustrated out of it. So, okay. So, so pace yourself and, and have reasonable expectations is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I hate to be pessimistic but kind of <laughs> yeah, but you're not pessimistic because you did it <laughs> right which is pretty dang yeah. optimistic if you ask me okay so so Gary how long did it take you and same question what advice would you have for someone who's either already on methadone or thinking about going that route well me it was kind of two steps once I like I said once they took the care of me, that's when I I had just been tapering for a long time I didn't even taper I just taking it every day and going with the medication but once that happened I just made a point up that I wasn't and so I tapered down pretty fast but I don't tell people if, if you're comfortable taking it, like I said, I know a lot of people take it, take it every day. They're fine with that. That's part of their life. And, and, they're, okay, and they're okay with that. It keeps them from that's using that's, um, but If you want to, if you want to start getting off it though, you're going to need to taper. Like mine was two years and I did it at a, a rapid rate and it got frustrating. The time frame is the most frustrating thing. I tell people don't get frustrated. It takes three years or four years because mm-hmm. once it's done, it's done. Um, because we had a few goal. Um, like I said, first we were like, yeah. oh, we'll only go on a few months. Yeah. And then when we were like, yeah, well, then we were like, well, yeah. We'll do a year. We'll be off in a year. Um, so yeah, they don't get frustrated that it's you know, trying to. I get back to the farms. That's very helpful. Because I, I talk to her. I'd be like, you know, hey. I'm 20 milligrams here. I'm still feeling terrible. Like, it's just ever going to end. And, you know, help me through it. She'd be like, you know, you're almost there. So that support system, support system was a big help. So I tell people, try and find somebody that can help them that way. Yeah. And when you're done, it's still, like, the one thing we noticed, what she kind of told me, when you're done, I noticed, is you've done the physical part, but there's a mental part after, yeah. which I'm still going. There's that mental part you're going to have to get after. The physical part's first, but the mental part. And that part really surprised me, too. Like, I didn't, but it, she told me about it. It's, it's true. Just because I was a little bit ahead. Yeah. Tell us about the mental part, then. When you're saying that what do you mean when you say the mental part for me it's just it's it's getting up every morning and am i gonna feel bad or in that seven years i guess it's that seven years i kind of isolated myself it's getting back into society like getting back i i met i don't know with one of my friends face to face for the first time in four years wow it sounds weird but it's just kind of getting yourself all open so your friends maybe <laughs> contacting them even going to work like yeah. i've been in that environment so long it's, it's that's the mental part to me it's just getting back right there and it does take time or even like i thought that once I was done with some oxone that I could just, but like, I don't, like I was saying that I didn't, I don't think I cried for yeah. years, like years and years. And when I, as soon as I got off this box, I was like crying every day, I bet, like flooded. commercials and like just anything was like making me cry. Um, and I think it's just cause I like not dealt with any emotions for, um, so long or it's just like then suppressed. Like, just, like, like, about the time loss. Then. Time, like, yeah. The time, the time. Oh time yeah. Loss, the time loss. starts hitting you really hard. Yeah. And I wasted two years. I wasted five years. The people I hurt, the things that, you know, people I hurt, the people I cut off, stuff like that. But it, it's like a, the sadness hits you. It's like a grieving process right yeah you know you just you start feeling about all the times you you know somebody all the friends you've had for 25 years you just haven't talked to in four years just stuff like that and i think it is like 
Yeah, the, yeah, although there's that too, I think just coming off the medication, I think it's just like, I, I, mean, I think I went through a bit of a depression, which I don't think was all just related. I felt like I think it was a, you know, um, I just, my, my, just everything was really unstable. I think just because you're giving up another opiate so even though it was a slow taper you're still it's the first time that i've ever not had opiates in my system and god knows how long she gave me an idea in the beginning when i first got off and i actually tried it because it was true it was the mental part. the first day i got up and i didn't go to that pharmacy i was really hurt mentally because in my mind that was that was a daily routine the right part of the ritual so she told me just take a drive down park in the parking lot so i did and then i went home and it actually helped a little so it's just that ritual that mental ritual you know your mind you say supposed to be there at this time i'm supposed to be getting their medication what's going on that was one of the things I missed most about when we stopped doing the pills was the ritual of preparing it. It was uh, it was one of one of the things that like I found hardest to let go of. Um, and the same with you get you used to go into the pharmacy every day and seeing those people and it just becomes part of your daily routine. So it's hard to let go of those daily routines. Um, and get, in, get into a new like cycle of whatever happy thing you need to do to replace that. So there's a what you guys are saying is just um, really ringing true on a on a bio biological level. So one of the things um, that I want to mention when you're talking about that last day and then the mental part kicks in, what what a lot of people don't understand about opiates is not only is it a pain reliever, but it's an anxiety reliever. Like a neurochemical level, it caps over your anxious brain chemicals. So it's not just physically you feel better, emotionally and mentally you feel better. So when you go through withdrawal, not only do you have the physical pain rebound, but you have an, uh, your anxiety goes crazy, basically. I mean, you feel emotionally and mentally unhinged for a while. And that that's part of what what these guys are saying. And then the other thing that you guys are saying, which I really like um, on a biological level is you're talking about the rituals and the routines. And um, most people don't know, but you know, dopamine is the, is the addictive chemical with any substance doesn't matter. It's dopamine. That's the thing that makes you keep going back. Well, dopamine is actually released, not when you have the thing, but when you're uh, about to get the thing. <laughs> so like being in the parking lot, like the ritual yeah. setup is actually when you get the good brain chemical. <laughs> That's the trick of addiction. It's not, it's not the having, it's the wanting. That's a lazy weird on way to get that. And we'd be feeling bad, literally. We'd be throwing, we'd be throwing up, that. but you know you're going to get it. And then you're not throwing up anymore. Oh, you're good to go. <laughs> that, knowing you're getting it, it's a little sense. I didn't yeah. get it. Yeah. Right. Because I've heard of many stories about people say, you know, once they finally got a hold of somebody and they knew their dude was on the way, they felt physically better. And that's because you you literally get the brain chemical release. Yeah. It's like Pavlov and the dog. It's the bell ringing. <laughs> Even though the food hasn't come, your brain is like, <sighs> and there's like a relief there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, do either one of you have anything related? to addiction it doesn't have to even be related to medication assisted treatment but just addiction in general what's the one thing you guys would want other people to know um so well no probably the, i kind of said it but just knowing that by the time you realize that you've got a problem and you're addicted you've got a really rough road ahead of you and you can spend that time um like digging yourself deeper into your addiction or you can spend that time having hard days um but at least working towards um something better and that you'd be like sober and happy um i had told you before that um, anytime i heard anybody sober say that they were sober and happy i would just mean you're a liar because either you didn't have a problem like i did or you're not happy now but i'm not lying and i really did have a really bad problem and it's just it is possible yeah, I just echo the same thing. It's, it's possible. Don't give. There were times where I thought I'd never. Like there were times where I thought I'm just gonna end it because so I can't do this anymore. And you know, I just can't get there. But you, you can get there. It's gonna be hard. And once you're there, like right now, you think so much clearer. Like you said, it, it, it must affect your brain chemistry because since we've come <laughs> off everything, it's I, you'll know, think so much clearer. The decisions you're making, like you look back there, it's just a total. And difference. It, it's funny because I said that you, know, you can read, you can feel your brain just thinking yeah. differently. It just feels like you can feel like rewiring your brain happening. Um, it's really neat stuff. <laughs> and you get that hope back to hope for your future. You actually know that, you know, now you can start doing things for your future. You can start making changes. So I just tell people, don't give up. It, it does get better. Right. And you do eventually feel better. And would you say it's worth it? Um, like, I'm sure I don't, I did. I Hardest thing I ever did in my life. Best thing I ever did in my life. 
yeah and i'm sure that if i were using it, i probably we would be. i don't know if i i don't know if i'd still be alive or whatever but, um, I absolutely but it's just such a dismal um it's it's such a hopeless existence and uh it doesn't have to be that way okay so the big takeaway that i'm gonna get from this and and hopefully other people will get their takeaway is the yes it's difficult but it's gonna be difficult every day if you're using anyway <laughs> And so at least this difficult is getting us somewhere and there's an insight. And at the end, you'll feel different. You'll think completely differently. You'll you'll think clearly. You'll feel better. And you won't have to wake up feeling sick every day anymore. You don't have, you can get off of that treadmill and never have to get back on. And, and once you start, like, we're well, for once we started, like, on the medical, there's so many, like, little milestones where, you're like, oh my God, this is so much better and so much different. Like I said, the first day that we woke up, we weren't, like, really sick or, um, like, we could like, actually spend time. Because- or when you realize, you can like leave for a few days because you don't have to be on your medication or just it's just there's a lot of those little little things you don't think of when you little things you don't think about little lights at the end of the tunnel that make it worth it along it's not just like it's not just there's lots of little um positives lots of little positives along the way for sure well i'm so glad you said that right because it's not horrible the whole way right it's just there's better days and worse days but it gets a little bit and a little bit and a little bit well attest to that 200 days sick it gets better and at the end it's a lot better and there's yeah then as when you're addicted there's just so many little things that you don't realize that you don't um that you don't have in your life anymore or that type of thing that you just completely forget that you can you know you just think that it's normal to wake up sick or whatever and you can you make there's all these things that you normalize in your life when you're addicted that aren't normal at all and uh you start getting that issue progress yeah it's just seeing. neat to get back to normal so for everybody who's watching this i hope that all of you appreciate the magnitude of hearing two people who came off of opioids who've beaten opioid addiction they did it in an outpatient basis they didn't go to inpatient they did it on their own while in a relationship and got through it every single day until they came out the other end of that tunnel it's really huge and i think hearing you guys a story is going to do a world of good for a lot of other people well, i hope yeah, so, I hope so. so. Hope so. And like and I, your channel has done a world good for me too uh, i started uh watching your channel when i kind of felt like a little bit of a relapse maybe coming on type thing and just like uh, understanding the psychology of it is helpful too <laughs> i watch your channel is what meditation did for me it just helped me mentally yeah and, uh, you know Funny. if anybody had any questions did they ask you a question you want to pass on them i would be more than happy to answer anything mm-hmm. for anybody okay and what people can do also is um you can put the questions in the comments and um um, of the video and if if need be i'll even pass them on to you guys um but i'm sure that um emma and gary will take a look after the video launches and, and try to look at y'all's questions and and give you guys some feedback if you want in your comments anyway so i'll especially look at this we'll <laughs> right because that's how i met emma because i was so used to seeing her name come up in the comments i felt like i knew you already from talking back and forth in comments <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. yeah. she's she's all the comments and then she, she loves your channel and she was always on well, I um, want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your story. It's an amazing story. And and I just hope everyone can appreciate how amazing it is as much as I do, because it just it just blows me away that you guys are able to do that and do that together. So now I'm going to have to stop telling people that it can't, that can't be done. The relationship and the doing it at the same time part, I've always told people can't be done, but now I know that it can. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Amber. Thanks for having us, Amber.